Yay Networks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sour Loss Sweet Lessons. I am your host, Deshauna Barber, and I am so excited to be coming back to you all with another episode. Today's episode is called Fending Off Fair Weather Friends. Now, for those that don't know what a fair weather friend is, a fair weather friend is someone who is not a friend when you are in a challenging position. They're someone that dips out and is gone when you need them the most. They love to be be near you when life's on a high, but when life's on a low, they are nowhere to be found. There's also a element of opportunistic mentality when it comes to fair weather friends. Sometimes they are users and takers and they're not givers. So today I'm excited to talk about that. And especially when we're talking about it in the context of how to stay away from this. When we talk about the fact that Sour Loss Sweet Lessons is all about self-care, self-love and self-improvement. When it comes to having a mindset that's based in self-care, you want to make sure that your relationships are genuine and that they are authentic. And in this type of world, sometimes that can come in the form of being very particular and specific with your friendships. And that's what I'm excited to talk about today. Now, as you all know, I was Miss USA a long time ago. And I had my fair share of difficulties when it came to vetting people because at the time I'm a normal person, you know, don't have a lot of money in the bank, don't have a lot of connections. I was very young and in the world just trying to make it. So I really feel like my friendships were actually easier to screen because I was not in the public eye. I was not public facing at all. I, there was not <laughs> a lot of opportunistic opportunities that could come out of Deshauna at the time. And obviously when I won Miss USA and I got a platform, that's when things got weird. <laughs> that's when things got very weird. And I'm going to give you all a specific story of right after I won Miss DC USA. This is a very interesting story. Okay. When I won Miss DC USA, we had a photographer that was the sponsor for Miss DC USA. There's a bunch of sponsorships that you get when you win your state title and you get a dental package that's sponsored. You get a makeup sponsor, a hair sponsor, like you get everything. And you also get photographers that provide free photo shoots for you. Now, <laughs> I had worked with this photographer previously and that was prior to Miss DC. And when I won Miss DC, I got to work with this photographer again. This photographer was in the South so I drove to this photographer. They're probably like six, seven, eight hours away. I'm not going to say anything specific because I feel like pageant people might be able to put two and two together. And Deshauna is not interested in being messy. I'm just interested in providing a lesson. So on my way to this photographer, I picked up my mother. Now, as you all know, my mother at the time had been diagnosed with lung cancer probably a year or so before this was in... I think I drove to them in 2016. She was diagnosed in 2014 of lung cancer. So my mother really wanted to be involved with my entire reign. Like she was so excited. She knew the seven year journey. And I remember when I told her, yeah, I have to drive past you in North Carolina to get to this photographer. She said, you know, come pick me up. I want to be there, blah, blah, blah. Now, mind you, my mother, because she had lung cancer, she had a tough time breathing. So she was actually on an oxygen tank. So we had to, you know, she had to be, use a, uh, like a cane to walk and then drag along her oxygen tank and all these other things. So it was very clear that she was sick. And when we got to the photographer's studio, they were a couple actually. And I brought one of them a gift 
you know, just to say thank you for the sponsorship. That's what you do when you're a queen and you represent a certain title and a and you represent a franchise. Anytime you see the the sponsor, you not only want to post them and tag them, you want to bring them a gift because they're offering you free services for just because of who you are, just because of the title you offer. And then in exchange, they get exposure by being able to have you posted on your platform and all these other things. So I bought this person a gift with me. And the first thing she does is she takes the gifts, drops it on the ground, walks away. I'm like, okay, that was interesting. <laughs> that was a little weird. And uh, my mom noticed it. She's like, is she okay? And I'm like, yeah, she's, I don't know what's going on here. So they put us into a room to get ready. Now, mind you, I got my makeup done before I got to the studio. I think that may have offended her a little bit because she also does makeup and it's a package deal. And I told her, hey, you know, I found a makeup artist that I would prefer to do my makeup as you as you all may know, chocolate girls like it's a certain type of makeup that you have to get done sometimes when you have makeup artists they just don't have the colors they don't have the the they don't have anything that they need to be able to properly cover your face and i had gotten my makeup done by her before and i did not like it <laughs> the color didn't match nothing was working so i told myself that i am not going to get my makeup done by her again but i appreciated the photography and i wanted to avoid headshots that i could not use and unfortunately, when I had worked with them pr prior to winning Miss DC, I was not happy with my headshots at all. Moving on. So we go into the back room and there's another national title holder there. Her I don't remember her name, but she was Miss United States at the time, I believe. When I tell y'all, my mother and I sat in this back room for at least, <laughs> I mean, hours. It had to have been hours that we were sitting in the back room waiting for them to come back so we could do the shoot because they were so focused on shooting Miss United States. And, you know, she was a beautiful girl. And I I thought that it was really great. Some of the work that they were doing with her, you know, I would kind of come out, kind of look, see how things were going. But it was during my time slot and they might have double booked, which is fine, but maybe like tote back and forth between the two of us. But to me, it just felt like they were completely ignoring my mother and I. So then they pull in, they, I kid you not, I drove hours and they did two looks, maybe two looks. And we were, the, the shots were click, 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 click. Okay, next look, click, 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 click. And we're done. But Miss United States, <laughs> Miss United States got hours and hours of time in different spots around the studio. Like she got queen treatment. And then me, Miss DC USA. And at the time, DC had not placed at Miss USA in over 10 years. So we were not a state that was like a California or a Florida or a Texas or New York. We were a state that was very overlooked. So because I was a very overlooked state, I did not feel like they really prioritized making sure that I got really good shots. And I also don't think that they were very kind to my mom. Even in, you know, do you want some water? Does she need somewhere to sit? Like th th there's little things that you, that you do. You, you want to be kind to somebody, especially when they're clearly on an oxygen tank and they're very ill. And I just felt like she was very rude. Now, her husband, on the other hand, was quite nice. He was the photographer, but I felt like she was incredibly rude. And I did not like her behavior and I did not like her attitude. My mom kept saying, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. And I'm like, mom, she's being very rude. I don't like the way that she's speaking to the both of us. I also don't like that we drove over eight hours. I'm not joking. Drove... <sighs> Maybe I drove eight hours because I had to drive two hours into North Carolina to pick her up. But to, from DC to where I was going was probably be about six hours. And I told him, I hate that I've driven this far, <laughs> this far. And these people are ignoring me. And if, if, 
I just didn't appreciate the fact that it felt as though they were prioritizing someone else over me while also being very mean to my mom. I did not like that. I did not like that I drove that far all to get two, three decent shots out of it. I didn't like that either. And I just felt like this was happening because I was not a state that was considered competitive. That's the truth. I'm not, I was not in a state that's considered competitive at all. DC rarely placed over the 60 plus years of the organization, but definitely in the past, the past 10 years, they had not placed. So anywho, we leave and I reach out to them about the headshot, what's the status? And probably this is maybe a few days before the headshots are due to Miss USA and it's months after the shoot. And I reach out to her, hey, you know, just want to check in on the status of the photos. Da, 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 da. And of course, this is seven years ago, so I know I got to get my my uh, memory together. It's not the greatest, but I remember her also being very snappy in the text messages about me switching one of the headshots that I originally chose. I said, hey, you know, I want to use this headshot, but I actually changed my mind. Can you use this headshot? And she was so snappy with me and I, I I did not quite understand why she was being so rude. And she was so rude to the point where I called my director and I said, Hey, I think that these, these, this, this couple photography group, they're great. But I actually have decided that because of their behavior, I don't want to use the photos that they sent me as my official headshot for Miss USA. That's how upset I was, you all. They're supposed to provide my headshot for Miss USA. And I decided, yeah, no, I don't want to use anything from them anymore. I'm, I'm good. So I actually went and got another shoot done in Maryland with someone that's still a friend of me to this day. And he created the most beautiful headshot for me. I'm going to make sure it's put into the podcast so you guys can see it. And it became my headshot for USA. I get to USA. I win Miss USA. Guess who messages me the next day to congratulate me about winning Miss USA? I'll tell you all the rest right after this break. Welcome back to Sour Law Sweet Lessons. Okay, let's dive back in. Guess who texted me the day after winning Miss USA, y'all? Guess who texted me? This person did. This 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 lady texted me, and I didn't I didn't save their number. So she messaged me and said, "Oh my gosh, congratulations on winning Miss USA!" Blah 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 blah. And I said, "Who is this?" And she said, "Such and such and such." And I never responded. After like thirty minutes of me not responding. This person texts back again and said, hello, question mark, question mark. Never responded. Never responded. And not only after they said hello, they messaged me again and said, how is your mom doing? Again, silence. Because... Now suddenly we care about my mom. <laughs> now suddenly we care about my mom. That's weird. Can we admit guys that that's a little weird? If you see somebody that's on an oxygen tank, cannot stand up straight and is like crippled and walking into your studio and you just are completely and utterly disrespectful and almost treat them as if they don't matter. There's one thing that I've always loved about myself and it's really something that I've loved about what my mom has taught me just throughout my life. She's like, you have to be kind to people. You have to be kind to people, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, you have to be kind to people. And here's why one, that's just the godly thing to do. You know, we're Christians. That's just what you do. You're nice and you're kind to people. 
but also you never know who the, you don't know who you're talking to you never know where someone's going to be you never know if you burned a bridge with someone off of something very petty and next thing you know they're standing between you and an opportunity so although we're not meant to look at this as an opportunistic thing you also have to consider how unnecessary it is to burn a bridge for no reason you just don't know you have no idea and there are moments in which i was having a conversation with someone I've, I've had this happen at a speech before i've had a conversation with someone and you know i'm rushing during a speech and a young lady walks up to me and says oh you know can you take a picture with my daughter and i i i was really i was in a rush and i said oh of course of course mm, snap the picture come to find out <laughs> she was the wife of the ceo of the company the next thing you know the company donates you know a, a massive amount of money to my nonprofit. It, it, you just don't know, but it's not even about not knowing. The main thing is that if you're kind to everybody, you don't have to worry about anything after that. It's just the human, it's the human thing to do, but it's also important to do because this could be an unnecessary burned bridge. People always remember how you make them feel. They don't necessarily remember what you said. They don't even necessarily remember what you did, but they remember how you made them feel. And there are going to be moments where they're in a room where they're possibly in a room and they say hey you've met her before what do you think about her how was that interaction and they can say she was fabulous i loved her she was sweet she was amazing she was genuine or she could say mm, 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 i don't know her I don't, I don't know you really just don't know who you're communicating with you don't know who you're talking to and regardless of who they are they deserve respect and they deserve human decency and it's really unfortunate that these individuals treated not only myself in that way but treated my mom that way when she's sick all for her to pass away a few months later i don't know if this person in particular feels any regret i don't quite expect them to because they don't seem like a good human being in the first place but i wonder sometimes if they think about that if that they think to themselves wow the last time i spoke to this person and interacted with her and her daughter i was rude and i was mean and i was not accommodating and i seemed very distant and i was not interacting with them and i was so focused on miss united states all for the person one my mom to pass away and then for me to go on to win miss usa and in months of communicating with me this is the first time you ask how's your mom doing which is after i win the competition i'll tell you all and i have to be completely honest people scare me <laughs> people scare me opportunistic people scare me actually they make me deeply uncomfortable and they make me uncomfortable because motives it takes my status or it takes the placeholder that i have in the world for you to treat me with respect i have to have some sort of status for you to treat me with respect you have to feel as though i have something that i can offer you for you to treat me with human decency and my mom who was very sick at the time so it's sad it's sad it's heartbreaking i think about it sometimes and it makes me want to cry i'm so grateful though because my mom was just <laughs> my mom could have gotten mad she could have gotten frustrated she could have yelled she could have screamed she was going through so much emotionally and even in moments in which i said mom you know what i didn't like the way she said that to you i'm gonna go say something my mom said don't do it it's okay it's okay and it's just it's crazy the amount of kindness and you know it's it, it takes a humble heart to be able to be okay with someone being this disrespectful but she knew that this photographer was in charge of my headshots a headshot that is so incredibly important in the pageant space when you're competing for a national title your headshot is incredibly important she didn't want me to burn this bridge for the sake of the competition and sometimes i think back to myself there are a thousand other photographers in the world why do i care why do i care 
but I, I chose not to think of it that way. And I kind of just let them do what they do. And in the end, when they text me, it almost felt like redemption for me to just leave them on scene <laughs> for me to say, yeah, I'm not going to communicate. I'm, I'm not going to interact with you. I think I actually blocked them after that. I'm not even going to lie. I'm, I might've actually hit the block button because I didn't want them to even have my phone number. There's just nothing for us to talk about. Now that's a story from 2016. Now let me tell you all about something that happened recently, right after this break. <laughs> Welcome back from the break. Okay, let me tell you something that happened 2020 time frame up until now. Okay. <laughs> I got an Instagram DM by a person that I was very cool with in 2020 time frame. 2019, 2020, we were really cool. And she had a 30th birthday coming up. Her 30th birthday was December of 2020. Now you all remember what was happening in 2020, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Her birthday was in Zanzibar, which is like a dream for me to go to Zanzibar. <laughs> Very excited to go to Zanzibar. And we thought when we first when we were first contacted about her 30th birthday, we rem I remember her reaching out to us very, at least six months prior. And I know we're all naive when it comes to COVID, but I know that majority of us did not know that COVID would last the length of time that it lasted. But the COVID lasted so long, we're just now kind of getting out of it, right? I put in my deposit, I bought my flight, I did all of this because I thought that by December 2020, and this is like, April, May, June, that we would be out of this pandemic, life would be okay, we'd be able to travel, no big deal. That's not what happened. As each month got closer, more concerns start to be raised that by myself and the other group in the travel group that was gonna go, we start raising concerns that, hey, the pandemic is not looking good. Like, I don't know if we need to go to Tanzania right now. I don't know if this is a good idea right up until about two weeks out, I was going to go. And then my dad, who I was living with at the time, because remember you all, uh, in 2020, I got out of a terrible breakup. If you don't remember, you're going to have to go back a few episodes. But I got out of a breakup, left Hawaii, and moved in with my dad. And then I moved to Chicago in January of 2021. So anywho, I'm living with my dad. It's my dad's rules. My dad said, you cannot go to Zanzibar. You live with me. That's dangerous. If you come back, you might bring something with you. Don't go. So we all had a Zoom call two weeks before the trip. And I tell everybody I'm not going to be able to make it. But I've spent like eight or nine hundred dollars on the house by then. I've already got a two thousand dollar flight that I can't refund. But they can keep the money for the house. I know it's already booked. Y'all can continue to go. But I live with my dad. My dad's saying I can't go. He says it's too dangerous. There's too many people that live in the house. Not going to do it. Things really took off by then. People are arguing. People are disagreeing. Voices are getting raised. It's starting to get really bad. But overall, we understood the consensus. Everyone's just started popping out like flies. I'm not going. I'm not going. And then next thing you know, nobody went. So after that, I contacted her, one, to apologize, and two, to apologize for another friend because, the, the, because of the arguments that ensued during the conversation. And she just said, I'm just mad, I'm sad, and I'm like, I'm just so sorry. Like, it, just forgive us, forgive the tone for people that got frustrated. I think most people got frustrated because they thought, I think she felt as though we were backing out because... We just wanted to back out, but it was a hard decision for us to make. And we understood that it was her birthday celebration and, we're, and we felt horrible about it. But we wanted her to know that we don't take it personally. This was, this just is a sucky situation and the pandemic is a little too dangerous to play with. So that happened, okay. 
I ended up saying, recommending, why don't we move the trip to somewhere in the States or let's move the trip to Mexico? Like, can we stay in North America? Because once you go overseas, it's hard to get back into the States if you test positive. But if we can drive, you know, if we get stuck in Mexico, we can drive across the border. But Tanzania is a whole nother thing. Zanzibar is a whole nother thing. She was against that. And it was around New Year's time frame. So everyone backed out the trip. I backed out the trip. And then I ended up deciding to go to Las Vegas with my now husband. <laughs> and guess what happened in Las Vegas? I ended up catching COVID. <laughs> I had to quarantine. I had to quarantine by myself in a hotel because my dad wouldn't let me back in the house. But here's what's hilarious about it. I think when I added up the dates, I think I caught COVID the week, the week before. And I think it might have been during the travel time while I was on the airplane. Like when I matched up the dates, it would have probably been around the window of time in which I was boarding, I was at the airport or maybe the day before. So imagine if I had been in Tanzania or Zanzibar and tested positive, I wouldn't have been able to get back into the States. They wouldn't even let me on an airplane. They would have locked me in quarantine somewhere. So it, it all ended up working out in the end. So two, three years goes by. I haven't heard from her. We don't follow each other anymore. I don't know if she blocked me. <laughs> I don't know if she blocked me and then unblocked me. I don't know what happened. But suddenly I'm not following her anymore. And that was not my decision. So I don't know what happened. And I get a message from her. And the message says, hey, I hope all is well. I see you're doing great in speaking. Would love to know more about it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is great. We're friends again. I didn't know, you know, if she had a problem with me or not. I really love her personality. I love the interactions that we've had. So this is great. So I sent her this long, long breakdown of things that I send to people that are aspiring speakers. Sent her this long breakdown of like, hey, you know, this is what you got to do. Do this for the website. You can copy my speakers reel if you want to use this. And she's like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. That's so sweet. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Like, hope all is well. And then after that, she started liking all my photos, commenting on all my photos. I was doing the same for her. We'd exchange DMs here and there. And I'm thinking, okay, we're friends again. I did. I it had been years since I spoke with her. Like two, three years, you guys, since I spoke with her. This is so 2021, 2022, and half of 2023. It's been two and a half years since I've had conversations with this girl. So I'm happy. Like I'm thinking we're friends. And I I didn't know if she had a problem with me or not after the the canceled birthday trip. But now I realize she doesn't. This is great. <laughs> and then. A month, month or two goes by. I get on the phone with my manager and we're just talking regular stuff. And we start talking about a television show. I'm not going to say what television show it is. <laughs> we start talking about a television show that this person was on. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, there's this girl that I'm friends with that was just on the season like a season ago. And she's like, oh, yeah, I know her. She messaged me. And I said, she messaged you? And she said, yeah, let me pull it up. She reads me off the message and it's the same girl asking my manager for representation. Now, mind you, in my bio, you can see who my manager is. She's amazing. Her name's Lindsay. I love her. She's been my manager for six, seven years now. But guess the date that she managed to send a message to my manager. Guess the date. I'll wait. She sent that message to my manager two days before she messaged me about speaking. Coincidence or not a coincidence? That's a deep coincidence. And here's what me and my manager figured out. I think she was messaging my manager for representation, which is fine. But I think that she didn't know if we were still friends or cool or something like that. So she messaged me just in case my manager asked me about her. I can say, oh, yeah, she's nice. She's this. She's that. But the timeline shows me 
that you're doing it to make sure that I don't have anything negative to say to my manager about you, which I would not have. I would not have had anything bad to say. Yeah, you know, me and her used to be friends a few years ago, kind of fell off. That would have been the end of it. But I think that she messaged me because I think she was being opportunistic. We have not spoken in two and a half years. It's very interesting that you're messaging my manager one day and then me two days later. Fairweather friends, opportunistic people, people that don't know if they want genuine relationships with you unless you have something to offer them. When you're down and out, this person is nowhere to be found. But when you're at the top, they're quick to call you, they're quick to text you, they're quick to reach out to you. That is not a healthy, genuine or authentic relationship. It's not a good friendship. And quite frankly, I think that people that have that type of mindset are almost dangerous to be friends with in a way because you just don't know their limits when it comes to using you for their own gain. You just don't know their limits. I think that it's incredibly important to make sure that you have friends that are there for you, whether you're at the top or the bottom, whether you are in a good position or a bad position, whether you are happy, sad, mad, down and out. I think that it's important to have people that genuinely want to be friends with you without you having anything to offer them. Now, mind you, I have had discussions about the fact that it's important to have friendships where you're equally yoked. All of my friends are successful, incredible women. We match each other, but we are the best types of friends because we all are elevating towards something and we want to help each other elevate. I want to help her elevate. She wants to help me elevate, but I'm not using her so that I can elevate myself. I don't want to be around her just because she's up here. We both give and take when it comes to the relationship. That's what my friendships look like. I give, I take, I give, I take. I provide, I enjoy. I travel, you travel. I'm there for you when you need me. You're there for me when I need you. It is an even trade. When the relationship is not only based in making sure that I'm only friends with you when you have what I need, but also... I'm not even a kind person when you're low. I'm not a kind person when your relatives are at a low point, but I'm going to be kind and sweet and genuine and interested in how you're doing when you're at the top, when you're heading towards something. That is unhealthy. That's unhealthy. And that's why it's important for us to make sure that we vet and we screen people. There are so many people in the world that want to be within proximity of us. And some of them don't deserve it. Some of them don't deserve the opportunity to be near you because they're only choosing to be near you because they want something from you. They're takers and they're not givers. When you were at the bottom, they were nowhere to be seen. But once you got up here, they are ready to connect and interact and network. And let's go out for dinner. Let's have brunch. You Have you heard of this new concept where they're called social media friends? Like social media friends. Sorry, no, no, no. I take it back. They're called aesthetic friends. Have y'all heard of that? Where people only want to be friends because of the aesthetic, because of the cute pictures y'all can take out at brunch, because of the being the, the, the it girls at the club and we can get a cute photo. Like they're not friends outside of the aesthetic Outside of the photo, we don't hang out. We don't have, you know, deep rooted conversations. I don't know what your mother's name is. I don't know what your daddy name is. I don't know where you're from. Those are the types of people that I do my best to avoid because there's a, there's a such thing. There, there are different types. I, I believe there are different types of fur weather friends. Okay. I think there's different types of inauthentic friends. One, the type of friend or the type of person that is mean and cruel when you're low and then they're sweet and they're kind and they're excited to get to know you once you reach a certain level. That's one. Two, a friend 
that only wants to be around you because of your network. That's two and then there's three. They only want to be around you because you look good in a photo. You look great in a photo. We're the cute girls. We can get a nice little aesthetic photo. Those are aesthetic friends. So we have to be very, very, very intentional about our friendships. I really do believe that that contributes to our happiness, our everyday happiness. These are relationships in which we interact with people every single day. I don't have time to interact with people that are only around me for certain things that only want to be connected with me because of my networks. I'm not interested. So we have to dive into the lessons, y'all. Of course, we have to dive into the lessons. How to fend off fair weather friends, but also how to screen and how to vet. The first lesson is observe their consistency. Pay attention to how this person behaves over time. Opportunistic individuals often show inconsistency in their actions and attitudes, especially when they're pursuing their own interest. Look for patterns of behavior that change based on your circumstances. Observe. Two, assess their intentions. Engage in the conversation and see what, 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 what is a person's intention ultimately. If all they want to talk about is, hey, I saw you know this person. Can you connect me? Hey, I saw you know this person. Can you connect me? Hey, can I work with you when it comes to this? Hey, can I work with you when it comes to that? But it's never just like, how are you doing? How are you doing? How's life? They only want to see more. They only want to seek what you have. You can tell that in the conversations for sure. And then are they self-centered? Are they just naturally self-centered? Some people you can just tell in their basic conversation, I'm just naturally an individual that only cares about myself. You can tell that when you have conversations with someone. Self-centered people are more than likely not interested in your circumstances and they're only interested in bettering their own circumstances. And then trust your intuition. Some people just make me genuinely uncomfortable <laughs> and they make me genuinely uncomfortable oftentimes because they have something deep rooted within them that is unhealthy, evil, and has bad intentions. And this, these for the photographer person that I'm talking about that I had to drive to and did my headshot, there was something about her that I just felt was just deeply disturbing. It was something about her behavior, her energy. I felt very uncomfortable around her and it just did not feel like a beautiful or it did not feel like a good interaction. It felt like there's something going on with her and I don't know what it is and I can't put my finger on it. And I should have trusted my intuition and not wasted gas or engine. <laughs> or even a, a slight of engine movement or activity on my old Jetta <laughs> to drive myself down to these people's studio just for them to disrespect me and my mother. Like, it's just, it's very unfortunate. And then the last one is to limit vulnerability and information initially. Sometimes I have a tendency to talk too much. Like when I run into someone or I meet new friends, sometimes I say too much and I'm giving them ammo. I'm giving them information that they can use to be able to take advantage of me. So now I go into relationships saying very limited information. I build up the trust versus giving it to them outright. And I think that that's really helped me in the end is that I no longer trust people up front. I think that people have to build my trust in the end. So yeah. That is the end of our episode, Fending Off Fair Weather Friends. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. This was a real story time. <laughs> this is a deep story time. So I really hope that you all enjoyed it. And thank you so much for watching another episode of Sour Loss Sweet Lessons. We are all things self-care, self-love, and self-improvement. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend, share it with a family member, a colleague, and please comment, like, and subscribe. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next episode. Bye-bye. Yay Networks.